Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the introduction. And all I'll say about Australia is, yes, it wasn't all bad, but lots of Australia is very sandy. Um, so um, as you say, uh, Caroline, I'm privileged to be chief exec of Hybrid Air Vehicles Limited. Many of you here will, of course, know us um, from the flight trials of Airlander um, that you'll see and the ground trials that were going on at the same time at Cardington Airfield. Um, and there you have it, as if on cue. Um, what I really want to talk about tonight is a little bit about the technology, and why we're developing Airlander, what it's all about, um, where it fits in the world of aerospace and in the world of transportation. Um, but I'll talk also about the business and the way that we're pulling together the different threads um, that we need to that we need to pull together to um, deliver a new technology, but the system that goes around it to deliver services to our customers. So why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and my aim will be to leave plenty of time for questions, and I, I hope there's lots of them. So I'm just going to start with a few headlines. Um, hopefully anybody that's been watching us, some of these will be familiar to you. What we're doing with Airlander is developing the world's most efficient large aircraft. So we're in a search for efficiency in aerospace in general. Uh, that search for efficiency has been sharpened significantly by the need to fight um, and take aviation's part in fighting against climate change. Um, so the world's most efficient large aeroplane. Um, large scale, L under 10 that you've seen flying around uh, Bedford a few years ago is a 10 ton lifting aircraft in a passenger configuration that's 100 seats. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more about some of its military applications as well. And at the point it goes into service, in flight it will deliver, depending on the role, between 75 and 90 percent less carbon dioxide emissions than equivalent aircraft doing the equivalent job. And of course, if you look at that the other way, that means we're using less energy, burning less fuel, and so we can do more with that aircraft for less fuel, less cost. World's most efficient large aeroplane. So getting to those sort of numbers, those sort of fuel and energy reductions and CO2 reductions at scale is a key part of what we're doing. And that's the start. So this is a family of aircraft that we're working to deliver here. Airlander 10 tons. Funnily enough, Airlander 50 designed to be the next generation aircraft, which will deliver 50 tons lifting capacity, um, six shipping containers, lots of space on, on board that uh, aircraft. And then onwards again in the, in the longer term towards really big airplanes. One of the things I'll draw out in my, uh, a little bit later is why we're doing that, why the physics of what we're doing takes you there um, as a natural end result, really. The other thing I want to draw out just as a headline is we're designing this airplane to be independent of infrastructure. Obviously, nothing is completely independent of infrastructure, but what we're doing is making sure that we can operate Airlander away from um, airfields, away from the sort of fixed infrastructure that, that we're um, used to in a lot of aviation today. So from a military perspective, that enables deployed operations to places that have been minimally or with very little preparation. Um, and in the commercial aviation world, it unlocks operations perhaps a little bit more like a helicopter, where yes, sometimes it's operating from a piece of fixed infrastructure, but it's capable of getting away from that infrastructure and landing in place and operating from places that aren't served by infrastructure today. Um, and there's all sorts of exciting features that come from that. And it's been interesting for us to see which customers respond to different parts of that. You know, it's an airplane that can take off and land from any flat, reasonably flat surface. It needs about six times its own length to do that. And that flat surface can be sand, it can be grass, it can be ice, marsh, it can be water. And we've seen lots of interest in that water landing, water operations capability from our early customers. And the last headline, about what we're doing is we're designing at each of those points, 10 tons, 50 tons, or 200 miles. In each of those, we've got multiple use cases for the aircraft. So by design, we're going after an aircraft design that will deliver to civil applications, 
and to defence applications. It will deliver in logistics, it will deliver in passenger transport, it will deliver in communications and surveillance roles. And it's a family of aircraft, multiple uses, world's most efficient large aeroplane. That's what we're all about. And I'll try and just draw out a couple of insights um, as we go through uh, as we go through the slides. The, the first of which is this isn't really an aeroplane, not in the way that we think about the markets for aircraft today. It's a bit obvious, isn't it, to say a hybrid aircraft looks so different. It's not it's not today's aeroplane in looks, it's not today's aeroplane in the way it meets requirements. And it's not really today's aeroplane in terms of which markets it's looking to address. Let me explain that a little bit more. So this is a very simplified view of work that was done first in the 1950s by von Kármán and Gabrielli, who did research into transport efficiency. They looked all across transport networks, different forms of transport, and they mapped the efficiency of those forms of transport. And what they found was that in the speed range of about 100 to 200 kilometers an hour, you get a drop off in transport efficiency. Aircraft, very efficient, move fast, carry relatively smaller payloads compared to other modes of transport, and are relatively highly energy intensive while we're using them. On the other hand, road, rail, and shipping carry generally much larger payloads, often carry them for much longer periods of time are slower and lower cost. And you can map the efficiency of those in terms of the, cost it, the what it costs you to move people or things around. And so the business case obviously is very strong for aircraft and they're very strong business cases for road, rail and shipping. But when you get into that 100 to 200 kilometer an hour sort of um, um, speed range, we hadn't found anything at that point that really delivered that same sort of efficiency and that speed range. Think about it, it's the sort of speed that helicopters fly at, and as we know, helicopters much more energy intensive, hence much more need. So our view, and it's you know, it stems from that original work, is there is a big gap between the two sides of that chart. Both sides are efficient, but in the middle there's a big gap. And one way to see that gap, I suppose, is to think about sending a package somewhere around the world. And your options are to send that package by air freight, and it'll be there a day, and pretty much anywhere in the world. Oh, your next best option is to send it over the surface where your journey of that package may be many, many weeks. There's nothing in between, is there really? Um, and as I'll draw out a little bit later, that same gap, it's perhaps not quite so obvious, but it also affects how passengers travel and it also affects how we use aircraft and surface vessels and surface transport in defence. So there's a big gap there, we believe, into which we put an airplane that is designed to operate at those speeds. And in doing that, several, several things get drawn out. Um, the first is, an aircraft that operates at those speeds and is efficient can de deliver long range services in things like logistics that sit right between the speed and cost of air freight and the speed and cost of surface transport. And from a market perspective, that means that we're not using Airlander to compete, compete directly with today's air freight. What we're doing is saying, there is a huge market here. 99% of the freight that travels around the world goes over the surface right now. It's only 1% that goes by air. But the 1% that goes by air is 35% of the money that's spent on moving freight around the world. So up here, we've got really high value, low volume. Down here, we've got lots of volume going on, but at a much lower cost. We put something in the middle here, and the market in logistics as this example, uh, in this example, is mostly coming from pulling items, packages, things that can currently only be transported over the surface and bringing them up into a premium, higher speed um, air service. So a lot of people come at this and talk to me and say, you've got a very slow aeroplane, how does that work? Well, I don't think that, I think we've got a very fast ship. Yeah, we've got a truck that happens to be able to go over water as well as drive over land. 
And that follows through into the other way, into the other markets that we're looking at with Airlander as well. So most of what we're doing really is ultimately about drawing things out of here. And the fact that we can do that with Airlander without being reliant on airport means that we can create connections that are really hard to create right now. Uh, we can move around bottlenecks that, you know, you think about freight bottlenecks and how difficult it was during COVID to move things in and out of the country and so on. So you've got an option here that bypasses choke points. And we've also got an aeroplane that where it does encroach on today's aircraft markets are the places where we're using aircraft really efficiently right now. Again, I'll talk about that a little bit a little bit later, but if you just think about some of the very short journeys that we do in regional jets, I think the median regional jet route in Europe is 370 kilometers. It's really not very far. So the jet isn't airborne all that long in that flight. And from an emissions perspective, and from a reducing aviation emissions perspective, that's a pretty inefficient use of today's jet aircraft technology. And so where Airlander does really move into some of these markets is where we've got very inefficient uses of jets because it's the only tool we've got to do the job right now. Okay. Uh, so it's not an aeroplane, really, not in a market sense. It's a new feature in our transport networks. That's what we're looking to put as a new option. The next thing I want to draw out is it's not an airship either. Um, obviously, it's got a lot of airship and lighter than air technology in it. Um, that's a lot of our heritage and our business comes from that, um, that sector. And of course, Lee, you'll well know the history of Shortstown um, and everything that's come out of the Cardington hangars over the years. Most of them floated, right? Most of them floated out of those doors. Um, Airlander didn't. Airlander was pulled out of those doors on the ground. And that's because it's heavier than air. It doesn't float. It's not an airship in the sense that it, uh, it doesn't float. What it is is a lifting body. So that whole shape is a lifting wing. Um, and the aerodynamic lift that we get from that wing is about 40% of what the aircraft needs in total to fly. The remaining 60% comes from the buoyancy of the helium that's inside it. And in and it happens to be inflated with lifting gas. Um, and so the lifting gas is just there to give us a head start against gravity. It's where the efficiency of the airplane comes from, but it's not enough to make Airlander float. And the reason for that, well, there's many reasons for that, but it's primarily economic. So you think about what it takes to generate sorties on airplanes or generate the next flight for EasyJet or Ryanair and make good money out of that or to make good services um, from it. You need efficient, fast ground turnaround times. You need to have the aircraft turn around for its next flight and back out generating revenues. So imagine trying to do that with a floating airship and your job is to take a 50 ton payload somewhere in the world and drop that 50 ton payload off. So you've got enough lift, enough buoyancy to carry 50 tons. And then you drop the 50 tons off somewhere and 50 tons of excess buoyancy now wants to take your airship off up into up into the air. So what you saw around those old airships was lots of people, lots of infrastructure, the big, uh, the big masts, of course, big hangars uh, to, to help manage these things. Above all, what you see is time, time being spent in setting up that infrastructure and time being spent loading and unloading the aeroplane, moving people or things on and off it, pulling it, maintaining it, all quite difficult when you've got a floating airship. So airland is designed to come down and land. You turn the, turn the engines off, pull back, and you're going to come down, you're going to land on the ground. Passengers can walk, that's a benefit. Freight can be handled on and off from the ground. The aircraft maintained on the ground, refueled on the ground, turned around quickly for its next flight. That's an economic, well, it's an economic imperative for the operator, and it drives low operating costs and hence low costs for the passenger that gets on board at the end of it. And um, the other thing it does is it compresses, combines many different forms of lift into one package. So what I mean by that is 
an airship designed to carry that 50 ton load has got to have enough volume in it to have enough buoyancy to carry that whole 50 tons so it's big and it's long and it's wide. With a hybrid aeroplane, hybrid aircraft, we're com com compressing that down because each bit of that aeroplane generates some buoyancy, but it also generates some aerodynamic lift. So for a given tonnage, a hybrid aeroplane, hybrid aircraft will always be a bit smaller than the equivalent airship. And that's important because size drives cost. So we're bringing the cost down with a smaller, more efficient package. And when, we, when I think about how we bring a product like this to the market, that's really important because the capital cost drives the cost of, um, cost of design, the cost of build, the risks involved in the programming getting, in, um, getting into service and the cost for the operator. So that efficiency is a really key that we get from a hybrid aircraft is really a key difference here very different to what we've seen over the years as people have tried to bring traditional airships into the market. It's a harder technology package to master. There's aerodynamics, um, there's high, um, high tenacity fabric structures constructed to create that aerodynamic shape, but also provide the stiffness and the strength that the aircraft needs. There's gas management in there with how you manage the how you manage the air mix in that in that aircraft um, landing gear um, maintenance all of these things are technology challenges that we build our way through and design our way through as we've developed airlander and that's why we've been doing what we've been doing over the last 10 to 15 years um, but having mastered that technology package, what we've got is a lifting wing filled with helium world's most efficient large aircraft, operating independent from up infrastructure, doesn't need a hangar to operate for the operators, and is a value proposition that allows customers uh, to make money and deliver great services um, in logistics, passenger transport, and in defense, primarily in communications and surveillance roles. I'm just going to have a quick look and see what other features there I haven't talked about. Um, I'm going to talk about engine and power plant in, uh, in a minute. That's a really um, important part of the package, obviously. I'll come back to that. The only other thing I'll say here is vectored thrust. So each of the motors, each of the engines on that, um, on that aircraft vector, um, um, not just also, at the, uh, at the rear, we've got steering vanes. So all of that helps low speed control and shortens the takeoff and landing distance of the aircraft. Um, can't see it on that picture, but at the top, at the front, the bow thruster, and that is an electric motor that provides your control at low speed. So all about um, being able to operate in and out of the smallest possible spaces, hold the aircraft on the ground when it gets there, and do it with minimal infrastructure on the ground. You may have many other questions, and please do ask me questions about the configuration or anything else you, you want to talk about at the end. So in a moment, I'm going to come on and talk about the use cases, the, the different markets of the aircraft in a bit more detail. But before I get there, let's just talk about emissions and how we get from here to where we want to be, which is a zero emissions aircraft in service. So we start off with this head start against gravity. The fact that we've got the helium, the lifting gas in, on board means that in all operations, if we fill the aircraft with kerosene, straight jet A1, and go flying, we'll get at least a 75% reduction in emissions compared to any other aircraft doing the same job. So that's our start point. That's just the efficiency that's built into the aircraft by design. Our plan from, so the first aircraft that come into service off our production line scheduled in 2027 will be kerosene fueled. They could be fueled with SAF if we only had enough sustainable aviation fuel in the world. We're not relying on that at the moment. Um, and they'll go into service and depending on the roles they're in, they'll deliver between 75 and 90% less harmful emissions in flight. The very, the next step is to start delivering aircraft with an option to have electric motors on the front. 
So of those four engines, the two front ones become electric or there's an option for each customer to, to take their aircraft with electric motors. We've been working on those electric motors with the ATI, with the University of Nottingham and with Collins Aerospace to really characterise what those motors, what the technologies need to be. And those motors need about 500 kilowatt electric motor there uh, to deliver that. Um, and behind that, we have a hybrid fuel cell powertrain. That's the architecture that we're going to use um, as we as we start to move electric. Then by the time we get to the end of the day, we're forecasting or the industry's forecasting fuel cell performance that will mean that all electric L under 10 becomes possible. So all four corners, all four motors become um, Again, it's, it's an option for customers at that point to take aircraft with all four motors, all four electric motors. And the only thing really that's holding us back from going there straight away is the range that we'll get out of onboard hydrogen and fuel cells um, at, the early, at the early stages. As soon as that fuel cell technology is there, we'll be offering that all electric configuration. And our ambition, and at this point it is an ambition, but our ambition is by the time we get to the we want to be doing that all electric. So that's kind of our challenge from our business to the uh, the hydrogen electric powertrain world. We really want to be in those regional class one megawatt level powertrains and be able to offer those on Airland of 50 from day one of its entry into service. That's our aspiration. And there was a stage where I would never have thought about standing here with a picture of Airland and the word hydrogen on it, because as you can imagine, everybody asks about hydrogen and 1937 and the Hindenburg. Um, so there's a cue for a question later on if you want. Um, but we do talk about it. You know, our lifting gas, of course, is helium. But when we went through the trade studies of how do we go electric on an aircraft like this and how do we get there fast, it's very clear that hydrogen wins even here where we've got more lift, static lifting capacity, batteries just aren't close. Flexible solar doesn't do the job for us yet. The energy density, the power density isn't, isn't close to being right there just yet. Uh, but hydrogen and uh, cryogenic liquid hydrogen really does fit the bill. So again, our plan here is to be at the front end of this, is to be a key part in the UK of pulling hydrogen technologies um, out of the lab and into flight um, and, uh, and play our part, obviously for our aeroplane, because um, we're, we're looking for the utility and the emissions benefit that that brings. Um, but I hope and I think that this will act as a bit of a flying test bed for some of the other technologies we've got in the UK maturing, get them up into the air um, and start working with them. So enough about what it is, what are we trying to do with it? Um, we have, really three major markets. I know there are four blocks there. Really on the left hand side you've got two parts of the passenger markets. So let me start there. Air mobility. We take the advanced air mobility concepts that we see in the world of eVTOL and we supersize them. We've got the ability with Airlander 10 to take 100 passengers in close to business class level accommodation. Um, over sorts of short journeys, that, that 370 kilometer medium distance, median distance of European regional jet flights, um, to do it at a price that is on a par with operating today's regional jets, and to do it with um, 75, 90, and by 2030, 100% complete reduction of tailpipe emissions. So big passenger mobility market there. It's been a very interesting thing for us. We actually started the experiential travel market, the one down below there. Perhaps a little bit of a smaller market, um, but it's got all the characteristics of an early adopter market in civil aviation for us. It's hotels, it's cruise lines, it's tourism companies that want to offer an air safari, want to get passengers up to the Arctic, need to do that without impacting the environment they're in, strong desire to provide uniqueness to their customers, unique experiences, not highly invested in their current fleets like the, airland, like the airlines are. Developing on the commercial side of our business in that experiential travel world. And we were very successful in opening up 
um, reservations and orders there. And the first aircraft that come off our production line will go into that market. We haven't announced the customer base there yet, but that's where they will go. Um, what we then was um, in the COVID pandemic, when whatever percent it was of the world's airline fleets um, stopped flying, people had time to stop and think and started to talk about different options for getting emissions out of aviation. And out of that work has come now 20 reservations of aircraft for Air Nostrum, uh, which is the world's, uh, which is um, one of Europe's biggest regional airlines, the, uh, Europe's third largest regional airline. Um, they are taking Airlander to go and fly 100 passengers at a time on a domestic air transport network in and around Spain. Um, including the Spanish islands. Of course, you've got water in the way there, so short sectors being served at the moment by regional jets. And um, they've expanded now their plans from Spain. They're now encompassing Malta and other parts of the Mediterranean. And it's really interesting for us. I mean, it's a very interesting business. But if you look at what they're doing, they're creating an option for themselves to grow their networks and unhooking that growth from growth in emissions. And of course, with all of our focus and domestic European focus on emissions reduction in domestic flight, that's a very strong growth driver. So they're really out there leading that. It's their reservations. They're really anchoring our civil order book. Now, with that civil order book comes the need and the fact that this will be a civil type certified aeroplane when it comes off the production line. So we're not going into the defence market first. We're type certifying Airlander with CAA. Um, we have EASA and the FAA working with them to do a parallel validation. So very early um, after the first aircraft are delivered, we'll have clearances from CIA, type cert from CAA, FAA and EASA. And that means we establish a commercial production line. Think about it like an Airbus production line, commercial aircraft coming off that production line going into those air mobility and experiential travel roles. What we then have is the ability to take those aircraft and modify them for defence purposes. So that same efficient aeroplane that can carry 100 passengers with low emissions can also carry a surveillance or communication payload for five days um, at altitude, medium altitudes, so between 12 and 20,000 feet, depending on, depending on the role that you're in. So same aeroplane, different use case, type certified aeroplane, modified for defence use, and we've got the two markets running together. And then the last one, logistics. Um, it's last there, but it's probably the biggest in terms of its overall volume for an aircraft like this in time. But this market responds to scale. Uh, the way Airlander works is a little bit like ships. The bigger you make it, the more efficient it is over the cost per ton kilometer. So that drive from Airlander 10, which is already as big as the biggest transport helicopters that we've got around today with longer range and lower operating costs. But the next step, Airlander 50, um, which is sort of the size of a C-17 cargo transport aircraft in military terms, um, but again, much lower operating cost. Um, that step up in scale brings the cost per tonne kilometre of moving logistics around the world down. And when we go beyond that to Airlander 200, it comes down again. So this is a market in logistics where we really want to scale up. So there's two reasons to start with these other ones. The first is they're very interesting and big markets in their own right. The second is you can address them economically with a smaller aeroplane. And so the development program and the certification program, the size of that, the risks of that, the capital cost of that are reduced. And by getting there, we then reinvest in scaling up our technology to get into the logistics markets. In the few minutes I've got left, I'm just going to draw out a couple of the sort of the unique features of what this will do for passengers and people in service. So I'm going to start with uh, mobility, passenger transport. Um, we go right back to that chart I showed. Um, and aircraft is not really the way we think about aircraft and aircraft markets today. It's going to feel very much the case when you're a passenger on board Airlander. So I've already said better than business, um, almost business class space, but at pricing that matches today's economy class pricing. 
Again, it's the physics of the aeroplane that allows us to do that. Spacious, so every seat can be accessible to the aisle, so no screen into the middle seat anymore. Um, every seat can be accessible to wheelchair users, so uh, um, a much easier aircraft to use and operate for, uh, for passengers and public. And because it's lower speed, it's lower altitude, uh, the, the design loads are so much lower, it's unpressurized, so we can move towards panoramic windows um, and start to have an experience where passengers can easily look out and enjoy the journey. It's quiet, it's spacious, it's comfortable, it's low vibration, it's low G, um, and uh, perhaps a bit more like being in the airport lounge, but a few thousand feet up in the air. A few more pictures there just to give you a feel of what that looks like. We had quite a, quite a long internal debate before we put our, our materials out into the airline to talk about this, about whether this should look like an aircraft or whether it should look completely different, um, like the airport lounge. Uh, and what we found, of course, is that different customers respond in different ways to different ones. So they've got the flexibility to do what they want to here uh, within the bounds of the economic case they want to build for their passengers. Um, in terms of where they then deploy it, uh, I've talked a lot about that median route, 370 kilometres. Just take a tangible example. Just go across the Irish Sea, Liverpool to Belfast, quite a thick route, quite a lot of traffic on that route. <clears throat> Today, to travel by air, obviously averages apply. We've had to look at this, you know, for the average passenger between those two places. But a typical door-to-door -door time for a passenger going on that route is about four and a half hours um, on the flight. If you didn't want to take the flight, it's best thing you can do is take over nine hours on the ferry. So those are the two options to take that typical door-to-door -door time for the ferry journey. Uh, Airlander offers an option which is a little bit longer in door-to-door -door time, about an hour longer, but getting on for half what the, uh, what the ferry journey is. But of course, the big difference is on this right-hand side. So four and a bit, four and three quarter kilograms of CO2 per passenger for that whole journey on Airlander versus nearly 70 kilograms of CO2 emissions on the flight. So this proposition is all about giving the passengers very little, on some routes, no real premium in their time they have to spend, no cost premium, so no green premium to get on board, same price as, as traveling today, but being able to overcome this problem here, which is consuming so much of our thinking about policy and travel and transport policy and domestic travel today. So low emissions, um, acceptable journey times, and um, a price that means we're not paying a premium for that experience. I think I've probably talked enough about logistics, so I'll skip over that in the interest of time. So what happens next? Big developments for us ongoing all the time now, which I'm very, very pleased about. We spend a lot of time on technology development, a lot of time really working to understand the market and get the fit right. Now things are starting to activate. So in the middle there, Air Nostrum, I've talked about them um, really leading the way in commercial air transport. Um, on the left, that's a picture of Airlander over Orkney. And uh, we're just coming to the end of a piece of work with the Highlands and Islands Airports Limited, uh, with Logan Air, uh, Orkney Islands Council, High Trans, the Scottish Transport, uh, Scottish Government's um, 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 transport organisation, um, looking at what Airland 10 can do for the Highlands and Islands of Scotland. And we were very interested to do this because <clears throat> we're no different from you. We think about weather too. I think a lot of people think, you know, is this going to be too slow? Is it going to be too difficult? Is it going to be too hard to operate in these regions when the wind's blowing? Um, and we don't think so, but we went out to explore that with that team. Um, next week, keep your eyes open, because next week we'll be publishing the outcome of that. Um, for here, suffice to say, I'm very pleased that we did the work and promised to publish it because it shows a really good outcome. We've got a reliable, economic, weather robust service that we can offer here that in places like the islands and islands of highlands and islands of Scotland can change lives. It can provide passenger services 
that are really difficult to provide today. It can upscale what we can take into the Scottish um, airport network, and it can have freight capacity, where at the moment almost all the freight goes over the surface with all of the delays and the time um, that it takes to do that. Um, so really exciting that. I think that's going to be very good in its own right, but it's also going to point to some really interesting directions for other island nations, other remote communities, other places where air services are difficult to deliver. And finally, um, just uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, we um, were privileged to sign a memorandum of understanding with um, BA Systems. And absolute delight to see some of you here today. Um, and um, that is really for us a very, very exciting partnership about unlocking the capabilities of Delanda in defence markets. We're working with the US DOD um, on several use cases. Um, we've just signed up a contract there, um, looking at the energy benefits of bringing Airlander into uh, into service with the DOD. But there's a lot to look at here in communications, in surveillance, in logistics, and in some really novel use cases, things like um, airborne carriage and release of unmanned, unpiloted aircraft from an airborne platform. So early, early days in a very exciting um, 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 collaboration there. Making this happen, is going to deliver great benefits here in Bedford and in the rest of the country. Uh, our production line won't be at Cardington. Um, she's in many respects a shame. And I know it certainly was um, something that people here in Bedfordshire had hoped we would be able to do at Cardington. But any of you who've gone and walked around the hangars and looked around that airfield today, you'll know there's housing, there's infrastructure. It's really being somewhat crowded in. Um, it's also in high demand from the film industry, which is great um, for Bedfordshire. So we set out our stall a couple of years ago to say we need to look out across the UK. Uh, we've teamed up with the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre. Uh, we've got great support from Doncaster City Council and the South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority, who are going to be investing in that production site. And what will be happening there is up to 24 Airlander aircraft a year coming off that production line and going into service from 2028. Um, that represents one and a half billion per year of exports from the UK. And they'll be supported by a team here in Bedford where we have our headquarters, we have our design organization um, and the corporate support functions headquartered here. So, Look ahead five years and thriving business in uh, in South Yorkshire and here as a, result, as a result of what we're doing. So I hope that's really given you a good view of why we're doing this, what it's all about, how we're trying to activate the markets and where you might expect to see Airlander um, in service in the future. There's a clue there as to where to get a ticket to go on board if, uh, if you want to do that. Um, we are here because able to do this, really. Um, these are partners and affiliates, people that have been come on board with us for this journey. Um, we're an aircraft designer and manufacturer. To have aircraft in service requires a huge team. Um, so this is the team that we've been building to make sure that we get there and make sure our customers have a brilliant experience when Airlander gets into service with them. Thank you very much for hearing me out for the best part of 45 minutes. Um, I hope that's given you a good flavour, and I'm here to answer whatever questions you want to throw at me. Um, really interesting, really interesting talk. I've been following, uh, and uh, many people here have following me, and uh, well, probably about 15 years now, at various briefings over, over, over the years. And, and, and I think at various times, I can sort of characterise by some of glass half full, glass half empty. So glass half full is a truly disruptive technology that can bring to the market. And uh, fantastic, the whole world is going gonna, is gonna to be down that part of your door. Um, and I think the glass half empty perhaps is you've got a really good solution, you're just trying to find a good problem to, to solve. Uh, and, and over the years, it, it, it sort of it's, it's waxed away. Um, 
I, I'm involved in uh, an aircraft program um, that's been having, hasn't been going nearly as long. But uh, one of the things we found is that actually, because we're trying to develop a new market the same way you're trying to develop a new market, there needs a lot of interaction with the potential, the potential market to actually find where the niche is. And I think what we've seen today is that uh, you know, some of those are really starting to happen. Some of the areas where you initially said, oh yeah, everybody wants us to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody actually is very interested in that. What they're really interested in is something over here. And I, and I think what we've seen is the evolution of that personal market slowly starting to generate. Um, and uh, yeah, really interesting to see the update. Uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully that 2027 will, uh, will come to pass and we'll start to see in large numbers coming out of the uh, South Auckland, and, uh, you know, from, from there on. So thanks very much for the, the update. You can also join in and thank you, Thomas, in all the way.